Um, my background, my name is Brian Fox. I'm the co-founder and CTO at Sonatype. Sonatype is a company uh, we developed Maven in the early days. We run the Maven Central Repository. You're probably familiar with that and the Nexus Repository Manager. People tend to know what those are even if they haven't heard of Sonatype. Um, and so that we started the company 12 plus years ago, doing a lot of Maven training and consulting. And throughout the years, we've had an interesting perspective on being able to see the download patterns of, and the, the components that people are consuming from that central repository and um, the sometimes shocking behaviors as it intersects with uh, known vulnerabilities and, and components and things like that. And so we've been trying to solve that problem for a long time. But a couple of years ago, I started to notice a trend that was a little bit concerning around malicious malware type injections into the repository. So that's what I'm going to talk quite a bit about. Um, since most of you raised your hand, I don't have to harp on this. I guess you guys all know this, but you know, most applications, about 85 to 90 percent of it is open source. So it's quite literally that iceberg underneath the sea, all the things that you can't see. Um, it's maybe not surprising to you, but a lot of executives don't realize that the applications their developers are building are actually composed that way. And um, so they, they tend to have uh, application security and other types of practices that are focused more on the custom code that your developers are writing and less so on all of these components that are just being willy-nilly pulled down from the internet. Um, we've done a, a number of studies over the years, 300,000 plus components by the average large organization, right? So that's a lot of components if somebody thinks they're gonna have a manual approach to being able to vet these. Um, and 500 billion total requests across all these different ecosystems in 2018. Um, this kind of shows the trend on the left here. This is Maven Central on the right. That's NPM in terms of billions. 2018, we had almost 150 billion. The number last year, we just calculated it was 226 billion. So it continues on this uh, massive upward trajectory, even in Java land. And everybody keep predicting the, the demise of Java, but we're not seeing it in the the consumption patterns here. And certainly NPM and JavaScript's not going anywhere anytime soon, right? So point being, we're consuming a lot of open source. Most organizations are doing so very willy-nilly, right? So how many of you would say you have a good handle on all of the components being used in your organization? Nobody, right? So if I told you about a new vulnerability that came out last night in a particular component, you wouldn't be able to tell me if you were using it. And if you were, which applications you were using it in, right? So it's not a great place to be. Now, let's take a step back for a moment. And I like to relate this to the physical goods that we as consumers tend to, to, to use all the time. This is a Chevy Cobalt. Anybody remember the problem with the, the Cobalt? It's been five, six, seven years at this point. This is a really interesting one. This is a classic failure of configuration management best practices. So what happened in the Chevy Cobalt, they had a default, uh, defective ignition switch that when there were keys hanging from it, it would cause the car to cut out and then they would lose power steering and brakes and, and some people died. After a long lengthy investigation, because they had a hard time reproducing it, it was quite literally the works in my machine but not yours kind of problem, they found out that what happened was there was a different revision of the ignition switch. The engineers found and corrected the problem but didn't rev the version number of the part, which actually compounded the investigation. It's why it was so hard for them to figure out what was going on because they didn't realize that when they were testing, trying to reproduce the problem, they were doing so on the fixed ignition switches and the accidents were happening in these broken ones, right? So this is classic kind of stuff that software professionals, we all know this, like make sure to use good version numbers and always rev the number so you don't end up with this type of problem. But this is what happens when software types of best practices manifest themselves in hardware. And as, as consumers of vehicles, we've all had recall notices, we expect that our manufacturers know what parts are in every single one of our cars. So when there's a problem, not if, they can do a recall. But everybody here just said you didn't know what parts are in the software you're developing. And I bet some of you here are developing some software that's probably pretty critical, right? So think about that as a consumer. Uh, this is Boeing. I've been using this picture for a long time. This has nothing to do with their current challenges. That's a different conversation. Um, this is actually an example of when it worked. The 787, when it first launched several years ago, there were some problems with the batteries where they were catching fire just sitting at the, at the gate. They were pretty quickly able to figure out 
that it was only a specific batch of batteries from one of the vendors of their, their battery providers, right? So because they followed good practices, unlike what happened here, they were able to quickly figure this out and take care of it, and probably everybody forgot that that even happened, right? Nobody thinks about this anymore. And then we've got the, the perennial kind of, you know, stuff, and, and if you're from this area, this probably hits home more than it does, you know, New England, where I'm from, but, you know, the, the lettuce recalls and all these kinds of things. A couple years ago, there was one where we quite literally threw out all of the romaine lettuce in the entire country because one specific area had a problem, but they couldn't figure it out. Why? Because nobody could tell exactly where the lettuce came from. It crossed the boundary when it, I think it moved from Arizona back to California. And, and basically all the lettuce that we threw out was fine, but nobody knew, right? So finally, after this happening year after year, this industry has started to actually label the region uh, where the romaine comes from. So if you buy lettuce now and you look at the package, it should tell you, you know, the region of origin. So in the future, they can say, throw out the lettuce from Yuma, but not from California, right? So I think this really makes it real what's happening inside of software. When the, these same things go wrong in the physical world, we talk about it all the time and we get really upset. Uh, but we don't talk about it so much in terms of the, the software. And so from a security standpoint, right, we've moved the maturity model from back here when everybody was focused on network attacks and trying to do firewalls to prevent things to the OWASP top 10, which started to introduce, you know, different types of common flaws to help remediate them. And then what, uh, 2013 components with known vulnerabilities kind of first became a thing. Um, Sonatype helped a lot to make that happen. Um, and then now we're at a point, and the thing that I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking to is that the bad guys have moved more towards recognizing that massive uptick in downloads is actually a really sweet spot to attack the entire ecosystem. And so if we back up a little bit, the first big one that kind of happened was the first struts. I could probably all know about struts at this point, but the very first big one that really hit was back in 2013. Right, and this was the one, this was pretty much as bad as it could get. It was network exploitable, uh, required no authentication. It didn't matter how you included it in your code. If you were using this version of Struts, and it was pretty much all versions of, of that uh, Struts 2, um, because it was processing the request and the vulnerability existed in there, it was exploited before a single line of your custom code got executed, right? So it just literally didn't matter. And so basically, it was so simple that there were modules in, in Chinese hacking toolkits that basically allowed you to like point and click at an IP number and get shell on the system, right? Now, of course, nobody runs their web servers as root, right? That doesn't ever happen. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of big banks did, and uh, they were getting exploited to the point where the FBI had to send out uh, field alerts to their agents to let them know. And this was right around the time when Anonymous was doing their thing, and um, a bunch of banks, coincidentally, days, weeks after this public disclosure, went down for maintenance, right? So read, read into that what you will, uh, but none of them did the Equifax and came public with it. But if you look at all of the stuff and, and some of the background information at Apache, you can see that it's highly likely that a lot of these banks were exploited by this very vulnerability. And what was interesting is most of the reports that were coming in came in saying, hey, we got hacked after the public disclosure. So the Struts team did exactly the right thing. They followed the zero day process. It was responsibly disclosed. They went through, they fixed it. You know, they released the thing and then did the announcement. And then people started to get attacked. Why? Because nobody was updating. Nobody was paying attention to the problem. And so then we got the next year, we got, uh, what's this, Heartbleed, Shellshock, right? This audience is probably familiar with these. Um, in real world terms, um, certainly Heartbleed, shut down the Canadian tax authority. They had a few extra days to file their taxes that year. Um, but this was kind of a new trend and it was the first time that the news was paying attention to this. I guess it takes a logo and a name to make people care about it because a lot of people didn't really care and react to the struts problem. People started paying attention to this um, but didn't do a whole lot about it. It was sort of, you know, the news cycle moved on and then, and then the world went back to their, their usual behaviors. Um, and then we got 2015. This was the year of commons collections, right? And this one around here might, if, if you live in this area, might um, be more memorable. This is Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital. And 
They came out with the details. They basically got ransomware through a vulnerable version of a JBoss web application server that just happened to be using Commons Collections. Right? So the interesting thing about Commons Collections is it's so popular, it's pretty much in every single application that's written in Java anyway. And if not in the application, it's almost certainly in the application server that's running it. And it's in the same class path. And so the reason this was so exploited is because they could basically assume that it was going to be there and be accessible. And so the attack relied upon uh, a class called the Invoker Transformer whose purpose in life was to deserialize and then execute the code. Like, it wasn't strictly a bug that was being exploited. It was just they knew that there was a grenade in the corner in almost everybody's application, and they knew how to trigger it is effectively what happened. Now, we talk about cars. We talk about seat belts. We talk about, like, the, the what was it, the, the Pinto study where GM calculated that it was cheaper to let people die than to fix the problem, right? So we like to say people don't react until somebody dies. Well, Pretty sure this killed some people. So let's think about what happened here. This shut down an entire hospital in a pretty big metropolitan area. I think it was seven days. Everything was encrypted. The medical records, the test results, surgeries had to be canceled. And there are some well-known studies that have looked at uh, 30, 60, 90 day mortality rates um, for heart attack victims around the Boston Marathon and the New York Marathon. And so if you have a heart attack on the day the Boston Marathon is running and you need to be taken to the hospital, you are statistically much more likely to actually have long-term effects of that simply because the ambulances can't get to the hospital as quickly as they would otherwise, right? So it is a, a statistically provable fact that those marathon days cause people to actually die more often than they would otherwise. Now think about what happened here. This hospital was shut down for a week. So people in the hospital, people that were supposed to have surgeries, people that had tests that they couldn't get access to and delayed care, what are the implications of that, right? So there's no news article anywhere that can say person X, Y, and Z died. But statistically, mathematically, it is a near certainty that this attack killed people, more than one person, probably a bunch. Nobody really thinks about that. Again, this is because of an open source vulnerability in a component. Right? In fact, it wasn't even really a vulnerability the way we tend to think about it. Like I said, it was just a class that happened to be there that could be executed and leveraged um, by these other attacks. So that's pretty scary. Um, talk about Equifax. I'm not going to dwell on this, but what I want to point out here is that the exploits followed the release of the disclosure just by two days. Right? So two days after... Again, the Struts team went through the responsible disclosure zero-day process, made the announcement. At the time this was, the release had already been out. Two days later, they were being attacked. Uh, Equifax was being attacked. And sometime last summer, the uh, NSA released a report saying that at the exact same time, on March 9th, Department of Defense um, um, applications were being attacked by the exact same thing. Right? So this is not a random occurrence. These applications were targeted by people who were sophisticated enough to turn this around within two days. So now think about an application framework inside of your applications. Can you turn it around? Can you update in two days and get it into production? Probably not. Like most people can't. But you should be thinking about that because you need to be able to automate the turn around. Turn around. You need to know that this is a problem and then be able to respond to it quicker than somebody can just go and attack your application and, and find that, that hole, right? So this is the problem that we're talking about. And it starts with that question I asked before. Do you know what application, what components are in your applications? Because if you don't, you've got no chance of doing this. So if we go back to that first struts one, you know, that was, what was that, 2013? We were here, on average, 25 to 30 days after a known disclosure, tell times when people were exploiting it, all the way down to basically two days in the Equifax case. So this was a dramatic escalation in the speed in which the bad guys were able to exploit public information. So this is basically the time, this is a quaint notion now, but this is the time when they were basically waiting for vulnerable uh, components to be disclosed, which were popular and used in many applications. They basically represent what's called a common mode failure, right? Every application had the same exploitable bug in it effectively. And then they would attack it. Well, turns out that wasn't good enough because now 
we've seen that they've started to actually inject intentionally things as opposed to waiting for them to come, come along. But first, it's helpful to step back and think about the economics of cybercrime. I consider myself pretty informed in this. I've been doing this for 12 plus years, but even this next statistics really shocked me. In 2016, the worldwide cybercrime as an industry was worth $450 billion. In the same year, the entire worldwide drug trade was only worth $435 billion. So we're approaching four years ago, cybercrime was a bigger industry than all of the drugs in the entire world. Now think about what we watch on the news, right? We talk about the hospital and the fact that nobody pays attention that people died there. How much time is spent talking about this and the war on drugs and all of the stuff, the opioid crisis and all of that going on, and how little time is spent talking about this, right? That for me was a shocking statistic. Hopefully it's uh, shocking to you guys as well. But it gets worse um, because it's predicted to be $6 trillion just a couple years from now. And drug trades is not a growth industry. So if you were a VC, you would not be investing in this blue line. You'd be investing in the red line, right? So that's not good for all of us that have applications that we want to protect. Um, it's really motivating and really explains why the bad guys are spending so much more time trying to get more crafty and figuring out how to attack these applications. So, by the way, that's $800 for everybody on the planet. But I think the growth curve is enough. So, it's funny, a couple years ago I was talking about this at a conference and somebody was saying, you know, basically, yeah, that's interesting, I've got nothing of value in my application. I probably said this years ago, right? We tend to think about, well, I didn't have social security numbers. I didn't have credit cards, you know, that kind of stuff. I didn't have public health data, personal health data. Nobody's gonna attack my application. Well, with cybercrime, with um, cryptocurrency, that changes that dynamic quite a bit, right? Because your servers have CPU cycles. The CPU cycles can print money now. So that means it doesn't matter what's in your application. If I can get your application to print me some money, by any means necessary, I'm gonna do so. Your visitors in the browser, they also have CPU cycles. There have been cases of people injecting JavaScript crypto miners into um, websites and causing their visitors to print money for them, right? And then importantly, your build infrastructure, including your developers and all of the development machines and all your CI, CD machines, they've got CPU cycles as well. All of these are now valuable. So it is no longer true in any piece of software that you have nothing of value because the thing that it's running on itself can print money. And what's interesting about this is we've basically allowed the attack itself to be directly monetized. So this is the equivalent of stealing cash from a bank or stealing TVs from Best Buy. If I come home with a truckload of TVs, I can't use that to buy groceries. I first have to sell them. That's when people get caught, right? So in the old model, you had to steal credit card numbers or social security numbers or other data and then figure out how to monetize the data. You could skip all those steps if you just inject a miner into this thing because now you're printed anonymous money. That's pretty much untraceable, right? So you take these sort of multiple things that are going on all at the same time. It's not painting a good story for us that are trying to, um, to, to protect these applications. And this is uh, one example. I'm sure there's more. Um, there was a vulnerability in Jenkins that had been found and fixed. I think this one was well over a year old by the time this, this exploit happened, but they were out there running on AWS. They weren't secured. They weren't updated, and somebody used it to, to print $3.5 million of cryptocurrency, right? So somebody paid Amazon to spin those, those meters, but it wasn't the bad guys. And so this changes another interesting dynamic when we think about how these bad guys are, are looking at the attack, they're going after our infrastructure and our developers now. You know, it's no longer sufficient to catch these problems before you put your application into production, right? So I'll talk some more about that in a minute. Um, this is another interesting example. This is AngularJS uh, from 2015. Um, the link to the details are here, but the gist of this is they tried an experiment to see if they could find a bug that they could fix a legitimate bug that existed in the code. Could, could I fix a bug, submit a patch, and have that cause a vulnerability to be opened up, to be exploitable? Turns out there was. 
there was a bug up there in the corner. It's impossible to see, but basically it was checking the headers and there was a bug. It was um, not doing it case sensitive per the spec. So they submitted a patch and said, hey, this doesn't match the spec. Let's fix this. And the, the project was like, great, awesome patch. They accepted it. Well, it turns out as soon as that happened, it allowed another bug that existed behind it to actually be exploited. So the, the, the bottom line is the case sensitive nature of the first part was, was effectively accidentally filtering out the attack, right? So as soon as that was committed, Angular then became explo exploitable. These guys submitted a bug and then they got paid the bug bounty for it in the end, actually. But this was all a grand experiment to see like, if I was motivated enough, could I inject a vulnerability into a popular project through the front door? by submitting a bug report and a pull request and have the team thank me for doing it? And the answer is yes, yes you can, right? So this is just one that we know about. These were white hat hackers. Um, and so they, they fixed all this before this version ever got released. So nobody was actually harmed in the production of these slides, but, um, but the point is still valid. And, and again, how many of these things happen that we don't know about? Because remember, $6 trillion, that's a big target. It's worth it for these bad guys, especially when they're funded by bad nation states to spend their time figuring these things out and doing so in, in full public view. Um, but the real trend, the re so I've been talking about a lot of that stuff for a long time. What I saw happening a couple years ago, it started in the summer of 2017, were two things that felt like uh, Groundhog Day to me, that there were two major attacks. This one happened in NPM, this one happened in Python, where people were publishing a typo squatted components, right? So typo squatting is usually thought of in terms of domain names where you pick a, a domain name that is .com instead of .gov or something with a typo and put a porn site or something like that. Well, these guys put in uh, malicious components that were collecting data and sending it back. Um, but but um, that's this one here. But what jumped off the page to me when I was reading the analysis of it was what's highlighted in red the attacks themselves were stealing the NPM publisher credentials. That was the first of its kind, right? Like I said, normally they were going after stealing the data. It was either sort of a new concept that they were trying to inject miners. But what was happening here is they were stealing the developer publisher's credentials, which means if I was an NPM publisher and I got attacked by this somehow, whether my coworker had pulled the thing down or whatnot, now they have the keys to publish my own stuff to open source, right? And so the same thing happened in the Python one, um, that it was collecting environment information and sending this one was going off to China, that one was going off to Eastern uh, Europe somewhere. And so just prior to that, there was a study that somebody had done research and found that at the time, was it 14%, 79,000 packages at NPM could easily be compromised because the passwords were either checked in the GitHub or um, just dictionary attackable password and you know things like this, right? So this this kind of speaks to the immature level of the average open source publisher in these ecosystems. We tend to think about the people who are creating the open source software as the graybeards who know what they're doing, the people that write BSD do a great job, that kind of stuff, and we tend to think that all open source is like that. But I'm here to tell you, it's not, right? And this is an example of it. There are more. Um, not too long after that, there was this interesting blog on hackermoon.com, and if you haven't seen this, you should look it up. It's a pretty good analysis. It kind of goes through and debunks all of the knee-jerk reactions where people say, yeah, but with open source, you know, many eyes, all bugs are shallow. Well, that previous Angular thing showed that's not true because they did that in full public view. And then they talk about the fact that, well, yeah, my developers review the code. Baloney, somebody found ASCII art images of Guy Fieri in very popular NPM modules. So you didn't even have to read the code, it was like literally jumped off the page and it was there for a long time and nobody noticed, right? Because we don't read the code, we don't know, we just trust the people that are putting it out there. And so this kind of goes through and dissects how exactly you might inject a malicious component and everybody was like, haha, that's funny and I'm looking at it going, mm, a little too close to home, that's a little bit scary, I don't like that. Um, this one here happened, this was an interesting one, so Go, um, the repository at the time at least was pulling stuff from GitHub. I don't know the backstory, this guy checked out, deleted his account, went away, I don't know. This happened just a couple days ago with um, 
some other JavaScript framework. Um, but he came back. But this one disappeared. And so GitHub at the time didn't prevent reuse of the ID. So somebody came along and republished a repository in the same coordinates as the old one. Um, now, it could have been a bad guy. It turned out it was just uh, some guy who wanted his build to work on Friday night so he could go home. He published a legit copy of it. But what if he didn't? Right? And so clearly, whoever was the author behind this was not thinking about the implications of his own actions for all of the consumers. Right? And that's the perverse sort of thing that happens here. With open source, we're motivated by trying to do good things and get good users and all this stuff. But then we don't think about what happens when you have the keys to publish this stuff that's used in hospitals and airplanes and cars and you get compromised, it could lead to your users getting compromised. Right? So if you're an open source publisher here, you need to think about that. If not, you're all open source consumers. You also need to think about that in terms of how much trust are you putting in these people who are checking their passwords in the GitHub and not paying attention to it. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. There's some miners. Um, NPM. This was an interesting one. This started to show a series of steps that were leading to attack. So there was a backdoor in NPM get cookies that had been published uh, for several months at that time. Um, but nobody used it. He didn't get any usage. So this was a bad guy who did a bad thing and then had no users. And we all know what that's like when you put something out there and there's no users. That sucks. So then somehow they published a new version of another popular component called MailParser and didn't even add any code to MailParser. All they did is add a dependency in the NPM manifest, the package.json, to pull down get cookies. As soon as they did that, all those people were basically exploitable. Right? So, I never found out how they actually got the, the ability to publish mail parser. It could have come from this, right? Who knows who has those credentials? They should have all been rotated by now. Um, this one's particularly interesting. There was a Python module focused on stealing private SSH keys. So again, this speaks to, it doesn't matter if you catch it by release before you put it out there to your users. I mean, that's important. You better catch it before you do that, if you can. But in this case, they're stealing SSH keys. So think about all the stuff your developers potentially have access to, AWS credentials, all these kinds of things. And this was hidden in a module whose job was to basically be an SSH server or an SSH client. So if you had something like Tripwire, you wouldn't notice anything fishy that this module was reading your SSH keys because you would expect it to. You didn't expect it to send them off to um, Eastern Europe in this case. And they didn't even have the decency to encrypt them when they did it. They sent it in plain text. So who knows who else has a copy of it. Uh, let's see, what else is interesting here? Here's another one, stealing NPM credentials. There was another module published. So who knows, maybe all these credentials finally got rotated. Somebody had to fish for some more, right? So you see the trend here. All those first things that I talked about, again, were legitimate bugs, security bugs that were published and disclosed and people were exploiting them. This is a whole new pattern that has emerged. And I haven't updated these slides because after 2019, it happens almost every week. There's so many that I wouldn't even have time to talk about it. And it's really, really scary. But this one here, that copay one, I want to talk about that because this one, so far, is the best way of tying all this together. Um, so anybody familiar with this one? Have you guys heard of this? Copay? <laughs> really? Um, this one made a lot of, a lot of, a lot of um, waves in the ecosystem. And so basically, there was a very popular module called EventStream, and it was written by one guy, as most of these smaller packages are. Right? These aren't Apache projects. They're not Eclipse projects. They don't have teams and processes. They're one guy who had a good idea, wrote something, and put it out there. And that's the awesome part about open source today is that we've made it really easy to share. But the unintended consequence is we've really dumbed down the requirements to be able to do so and get all of that published. And so basically, what happened is this guy, he worked on this project, and then it became like all open source projects. Eventually, it's like a pet you didn't want, and now you can't get rid of. You've inherited it, you've got users, and they want more features, but you scratched your itch, but you feel this sort of, you know, you, you feel it like you owe it to the users to do this thing, but you don't really want to. Some new guy comes along and says, hey, I got some fixes. Here's some stuff. I'm going to help you. I'm going to pick up a shovel. I'm going to start making some patches. It's like, awesome. Somebody else is going to feed the dog when I want to go on vacation. That's great. So after some number of rounds of this, basically he says, hey, do you want me to 
help you do the releases. I'll take over this. And the guy's like, ah, yes, take my dog, have it. So he gave access to some new person who basically had no previous GitHub history. Of course, we know that now. He didn't know before that um, to, to publish this event stream. And so then what happened is um, in subsequent releases, the bad guy created a new module, a whole new dependency that ultimately had some encrypted code inside it. And then, like that get cookies one I talked about, then added it as a dependency to a vet stream. So this happened in a couple of sequences. So anybody watching at the time might not have noticed anything fishy because the actual exploit was off in a module nobody cared about. Event stream had no code added to it. It was just a dependency. Dependencies change all the time. And so the, the, this attack happened sometime in the summer of 2019, or 2018, I guess it was. But it wasn't discovered until sometime late in November. And the reason for that is after they published this thing to the repository, they deleted it. It was only out there for three days. And I remember seeing that as this was evolving. We were very active in watching how this, this because we do this research for our customers. And I saw that, and I was like, that's weird. Never seen that before. Why would they de delete it? They must have known. Like, this is a really good way of covering their tracks. The only reason we found out about this was because that encrypted code was using um, a now deprecated NPM call. And so somebody out there was seeing NPM deprecation warnings in their server log and bothered to chase it down and found that it was in this encrypted code, couldn't figure out what it was and raised the alarm, right? And then subsequently figured it out. But what was interesting is as they unpacked this and looked at the code that was encrypted, nobody could figure out what it was. It wasn't code for event stream. It wasn't code for any other known uh, open source projects, but eventually somebody was able to trace it back and found out that it was private code for Copay, which was a Bitcoin wallet. Here's the cryptocurrency again, right? So basically what happened is the bad guys decided to attack Copay. They figured out some modules that they were using. They took some of the custom JavaScript that was of course delivered to the browser. They created a patch for it to introduce you know, some bad behaviors and send the keys and whatnot to wherever they wanted to, encrypted it, social engineered their way in, this took months, social engineered their way to take over this project that they knew they were using, got the payload deployed, they could obviously observe it, probably just by loading the page and seeing that their code was now deployed, and then deleted it from the repository, and nobody noticed for something like six months that was sitting in there. So everybody that had downloaded that module now had this code. Fortunately for everybody else, the other millions of people that downloaded it, it didn't matter. It wasn't, it wasn't copay. And this code was actually smart enough to look at the environment that it was running in, the application that it was running in, so it wouldn't even decrypt in a different environment, right? So it had antivirus or, or vi antivirus protection-like things baked into it. Right, so this just goes to speak to how sophisticated the attacks are, and this was two years ago. Uh, earlier this year, or last year now, um, there was another one at another uh, AGMA or something like that. There was almost a very similar attack that happened again. Right, so these things, we don't find out about it. There's certainly these things that are happening out there right now, and we just don't know about it. And so basically what's happened is, the time to respond before exploit has now gone negative, right? Like I said, two days. Nobody in here said they could turn their application around in two days post-disclosure. That was a quaint notion with Equifax. That was a dramatic escalation at the time. But now we're negative. We're negative six months in the copay environment. They, they had that stuff running, right? Think about all these other ones where SSH keys are stolen and sent to, to Russia or Korea or whatever. Um, and, and what they're doing with it. And think about all the NPM and the other publisher credentials that are being attacked, right? So we need to really change our behavior because we're dealing with an increased open source usage. Remember the charts at the beginning? This isn't going away. These numbers, those lines get steeper and steeper every year. We've got sophisticated, well-funded crime syndicates going after that ever-increasing VC would be jealous pile of $6 trillion. We've got the ability to directly monetize a bunch of these things. This means this is just the tip of the iceberg. It's only going to get worse, right? So how do we even start to approach this problem? Well, fortunately, if we go back to the car picture that I showed you in the beginning, you know, Edwards Deming helped Japan's industries rebuild after World War II um, and introduced some things that led to all of the traits that we tend to think about from, you know, Honda and Toyota. 
which is source parts from fewer and better suppliers. So as we think about this from open source projects, why do you need to have 15 different XML parsers or JSON parsers in your portfolio of applications? Why do you have to have all the different UI technologies? Right? It's because that's what engineers like to do. But from a risk perspective, a portfolio perspective, it's not a great idea. Imagine if Honda used starters from every starter manufacturer out there. That would be kind of insane, yet that's how we build our software. Use only the highest quality parts, right? So we shouldn't be shipping versions of struts that are like 10 years old, and yet people are doing it constantly. Hundreds of thousands of organizations are still downloading those own old, known for 12 plus years vulnerable versions of struts. You can only conclude they're putting them in that legacy applications and, and they're still out there, right? So why would you do that? Don't pass known defects downstream. So this means we need to think about catching these earlier in the development life cycle and not sending them to you guys, the AppSec team, and hoping that you're going to catch it later or you can do a pen test or you get a firewall or something that's going to catch it. And this one's really important. Continuously track the location of every part um, in your application, right? And again, everybody here, nobody would, would claim to know all the parts in their applications. But you need a system to be able to do that. Think about those organizations, the stat I showed at the beginning, 300,000 is the average. That's just Java. If you include NPM, it's at least 10x that, maybe 100x that, because the NPM modules are so much smaller, there's more of them. You need to be able to track the location of that so that you can do what we as consumers expect, the equivalent of a recall. Right, so when a vulnerability happens tomorrow, you know which applications are affected, you know where to target, and you can track the remediation and rollout of that so that you don't end up like what happened to Equifax. In Equifax's case, they got exploited actually from an application that didn't get updated. It wasn't that they didn't update any of them. It was just one that fell off the radar and didn't get updated. And so the, the statistics that show that companies that are able to do it, believe it or not, there are companies that can do it. Um, you know, the known vulnerable components in there is reduced by at least half, a little bit more than half. Um, you know, from 20% of components in unmanaged supply chains, in the average application, 20% of them have vulnerabilities in it, down to, or 20% of the components, down to less than nine. Or nine, no, a little bit more than nine. Right, so we've scanned lots of applications. We've never seen one from a company that didn't have a process in place that didn't have a pretty severe vulnerability sitting in it right, right in front of their face. And that's the interesting thing, is that in, as an industry, we're spending all this time trying to discover new unknown problems. So SAST and DAST and IaaS is largely focused on the custom code, the bugs your developers have created. Okay, that's important. But what about all the ones that your developers don't even know exist and the ones that the bad guys are just blanket attacking? They're basically fishing across the internet looking for people with commons collections on their class path. Right? Those are the ones that are more likely to get exploited. They're going to get exploited qu more quickly and you're more likely to just get caught up in a big fishing net. Right? So um, that's the end of my prepared content. Hopefully I've scared you guys sufficiently that you'll go back and try to do something about this. Um, and, uh, We'll take some questions, but first we need the microphone. She's got it back there. You know, what, what the industry is trying to do is get the equivalent of that, that in ingredients list so that if you buy something, imagine the router that you have or the webcam that you have. Do you know what open source is in that? No, you don't. It's defective, yeah, you can almost assert that it is, but, but that's kind of what the industry is trying to do. There's, as with anything like this in the standards bodies, a lot of push and pull, some big organizations don't want to have to disclose it. Um, but if you start thinking about medical devices, that's a big uh, thing, you know, where pacemakers and, and uh, insulin pumps and stuff like that have Bluetooth and other open source software in it and nobody knows what version, that's pretty scary. Right, so there definitely are initiatives to try and make that happen, but they're not there yet. And uh, so that means as consumers, it's on us to try and do the best we can to figure out what's inside it and protect ourselves anyway. We can't wait for everybody to adopt that standard. But good question. Anyone else? Identify. Do you have any suggestions on how to best start identifying the trusted vendors or the trusted open source communities uh, that companies should go after? Yeah, that's hard. I mean, obviously, there are products 
we, we can talk to you about it. But it, it, it's hard because there aren't good databases of that type of dimension, right? There are databases of the reported vulnerabilities like NVD and those kinds of things, but there's not an easy way to go and just as a typical consumer without a tool to help you figure out what's a, what, whether a project has a good history of hygiene, whether their bugs are severe or they fix them, um, you know, if they have a lot of turnover in the committers, right? The data's out there, but it's a, it turns out it's a lot of work to pull it together in a way that's actually consumable and understandable by developers. We've been doing a lot of work there, but, you know, what people tend to do is they ask their buddy, they go on emails, they try to count stars in GitHub. I mean, that's a proxy for it, but it's, it's kind of a mess, right? And that's an area that we're trying to help make better. There, there are some open source groups that are doing that, like Chaos at the Linux Foundation and others that are trying to define standards, but it's still very premature. Anyone else? All right, I guess we'll wrap. Give you a few minutes back. Thanks, everyone.